All right. Okay, so on to our third presentation of the day. Hello. Um, so just a reminder that this uh, presentation will will award one CEU credit. Um, you'll you'll receive that CEU credit electronically via email um, following the presentation after you've completed the CEU questions. Um, just a reminder to recall the code words, write those code words down so you can um, use those with your CEU questions. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Whitney Harkin. Um, Whitney is a master's level clinical social worker specializing in the treatment of individuals struggling with eating disorders, disordered eating, negative self-talk, negative self-esteem, body dysmorphia, anxiety, depression, suicidality, self-harm, and those who want to start liking who they are. Whitney has worked at all levels of care for the treatment of eating disorders in various roles. She supervises other clinicians pursuing certification in eating disorder treatment and is passionate about changing the disordered culture we live in. Whitney's research on inpatient management of adoles adolescents eating disorders was published in a peer-reviewed journal, and she enjoys presenting to audiences in all aspects of treatment for eating disorders. This will be Whitney's third year um, to present uh, within the Care for You YouTube retreat. Um, when not working, Whitney enjoys chasing her two children trying new restaurants with her husband and wishing her dog would listen to her. <laughs> Please welcome Whitney. Hello, everyone. Okay, wait, where do I look? That way? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They've got two screens, everyone. So, um, hello, I'm glad to be here. I have to say a couple things. Um, before I really get going. A couple things as far as I do love presenting, as Katie said. Um, doing virtual is a little bit different as probably many of you can imagine because I love to see faces. So I totally get having your videos off because that's what I do when I listen <laughs> to presentations. But if I can see your face, I also really love it. So I'm not, I tend to like think that I'm kind of funny. And so um, <laughs> it's hard when you're like, think you're funny and no one's there. Um, so anyways, that was my one shout out. My other shout out, you guys, is, I don't even know if people say shout out anymore, but I am. My other shout out is to all the parents out there who are surviving Halloween week, okay? Because parents or caregivers, because I don't know about many, like if you're like me, this week is a lot. There's costumes every day and treats and donations to bring. And it's just... I feel like I'm kind of in survival mode. So just a shout out to everybody surviving this week and trying to have some fun. Um, I appreciate you guys having me for a third year in a row. I also am very thoughtful that a lot of people do attend this every year. So I try not to be repetitive um, in what I present. I also wanna put out there that I am, I try to be very mindful about constantly evolving and what I know. I don't know about you guys, but in the last two years, I've been pretty overwhelmed with what I don't know. And that is both overwhelming and really exciting. And so the way that I practice even presenting to you this year is different than last year. And I've done more and more work on myself and my clients have taught me a ridiculous amount. Um, they always have, but especially this year. And so as much as we talk about what we're going to talk about today, I have 50 minutes to teach you some things and to give you guys some tools here at the end, but I'm also going to scratch the surface in the beginning with different things that could each be their own like day long topic. And to be honest, I kind of hate when presenters say that <laughs> I just said it, but it's so true. And I think some of these topics that I'm just going to mention, I can't do it justice, right? Um, like the racial injustices that go along with body discrimination. I am going to mention it, but I, that could be a whole week long workshop, right? And there's a lot of people that could speak on that much more eloquently than I could. So 
I, I want to put that out there and I'll speak about it more, like I said, throughout, but it's just really important that I express that in the beginning that I will mention things that I cannot do justice in a matter of a few minutes. So let's kind of get started. Um, there we go. Two screens. I feel like I'm, I don't know, very tech savvy, everyone. <laughs> All right. So here's what we're going to cover. Um, norms and myths. Okay. Which I think is really, really important. Um, this is also what helps challenge our own bias, especially that inherent bias that we don't even know we have. Facts and figures, so we kind of know what we're dealing with. Um, the good news, as far as some different tools, and so I don't leave you feeling like, oh, great, this is depressing, and now what am I going to do? Um, I really want to give you guys a lot of practical strategies and tools to use with yourself, with your clients, with your loved ones as we go along. Okay, um, I wanna, before we kind of go into the have you evers, I really, really want to make sure that you guys know that I am very aware and constantly checking my own privilege. Um, I was, I am in a smaller body. I am a Caucasian cisgender female in a small body. That comes with a lot of privilege and a lot of bias. Um, even though I do this work every day and I listen to people's stories of what it feels like to be in their body and to grow up in their body, it is very, very important that I am always aware of that, even with its, whether it's in my office with my clients um, or just in my personal life, right? That there is a inherent bias and privilege that I have and I can't, I don't ignore that. Although that can be a little bit, I think sometimes overwhelming as clinicians to feel like, okay, well, I, ha I haven't walked the same path that they have. And I think we can do this in any realm, right? It's really about learning and hearing what our client or our family member, right? Or our friend, what their lived experience is in their body, because that can change based on their family system, their cultural dynamics, even the area of the country they live in. Um, whether they're growing up in a rural community or big city, like all of those things change kind of the lived experience in our bodies. So I am always, always aware of that. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's really important for me to continue to highlight that there is an intersection here of the weight bias, privilege, racial diversity, gender bias, so socioeconomic status, right? Like I could go on and on that all affects our own experience, our lived experience in our bodies. Um, that's a big freaking deal, right? It's a big deal. And so as I'm talking about where some of this conditioning comes from as to why we are conditioned to hate our bodies and what in the heck do we do about it? I know that I am, I have to simplify some of this for this talk but it is not simple. And especially for people who have lived or have experienced trauma within their body or because of their environment and the body that they um, are set in and live in, that that is, that's really difficult. Um, and that's really big. So I just want to put that out there. And I want, I want you guys to all kind of think about that for yourselves, or if you're thinking about someone that, you know, that really struggles with their body image, Keep in mind that as well, kind of what their lived experience may even look like and how that affects it. I wanna pause and kind of mention the code words. So my two code words are fuel and grace. Okay, so fuel because food is fuel and grace because we're gonna talk a lot about body grace, um, which also means I guess you could turn me off right now, <laughs> but don't because I have some stuff to share with you. All right. And this is the one they're saying, right? Okay. All right. So let's go through some of the have you ever's. Okay. So have you ever, have you ever heard someone talking about their new diet or exercise plan and wanted to do it yourself? Um, said no to an invite or canceled plans because you didn't feel comfortable with your body or in your clothes, worried that you were not worthy of what you have because of how you look, worried that you may lose what you have, right? not gone after a job or opportunity out of fear of what others may think of you when they see you or not um, gone to do the presentation, right? Because you're worried that you're not good enough or that, oh my gosh, what if they judge me for my body or how I look, right? 
thought that if you just lose 10 pounds, everything would be better. <laughs> That's probably, yeah, 99% of people in America um, and been too distracted by what you were, were not allowing yourself to eat, that it was hard to focus on the conversation at the table. And I say that with holidays coming up. Um, it's interesting that when you do this work that I do in working with people with disordered body image, disordered eating habits, um, typically clinicians will take some time off over the holidays and it is by far my busiest time of year. Um, I try not to take any time off over the holidays except for the actual day because I know that it is extremely traumatic and stressful for my clients and they need a lot of support um, the day before, the day after Thanksgiving and it can be um, extremely overwhelming. So that that last one always makes me think of the holidays. I mean, any gathering, but especially the holidays when everyone's getting excited and thinking about their meals. But for people that are struggling with their body image or with food, this is the most stressful time for them. So, so if you answer to yes to any of those, you're probably, I mean, you're in the majority. Like I absolutely have answered yes to most of those, right? Um, so by no means are you, is anything wrong with you? This is the way that we're conditioned, right? And I'll go into why that is. So a couple myths, right? Body confidence equals thinking you look good. Not true, not true. You need to fix your appearance to fix your confidence. Oh, we are like sold this. God, I'll go into how much money the, <laughs> the beauty industry makes, the weight loss industry, which is really concerning. Um, it, sorry, no, there's, there's kids in the background. And I had that feeling right second. I'm like, is that my child? But my children are not here. Um, improving your body image is about learning to love your body. This is a really big one, you guys. You do not have to love your body to improve your body image. And in fact, I encourage you not to even try to go towards body love, but instead work on body neutrality and body acceptance, which we will talk about um, and what that looks like, right? So if it's like this feeling, this all or nothing of like, well, I don't love my body, so I hate it. No, no, no. Like we can absolutely move along the spectrum of that. Um, we are pummeled with these messages, right? Every single day by the diet industry, by the beauty industry. I mean, last year I put up slides that I like that I took pictures that I took at Sprouts, right? And every time I go to any grocery store, right? It's like, you check out, lose 10 pounds in 20 days. Here's keto this, here's how to intermittent fast. I mean, it's literally everywhere. You get on Instagram and it's it. I mean, obviously they have the wrong algorithm because I still get that crap. Right. And I don't like, that's not my thing. And I think they should know that by now, <laughs> but they still get all those ads. Right. So we're plummeted with it everywhere. So it's natural for us to start to think that this is our norm. And if everybody's doing this, maybe I should try it. Why haven't I tried it? Is there something wrong with me? Right. Also, I think this like loving your body, I'm all about this cultural shift into loving your body, but it's just not that easy. And sometimes if we try to jump to body love, we are not honoring kind of our story and the process of healing the relationship with our body, right? Like we have to heal that relationship first. Um, and also the last couple, you know, to having a positive body image, you have to stop comparing yourself to others. You guys, humans from thousands of years ago, we are designed to compare ourselves to other people, right? And there is an inherent a natural instinctual need to compare to others, right? Because thousands of years ago, when we were all in tribes and obviously still in small rural areas, you are, if you were not part of a group, you would not survive. You had to be part of a group. You were comparing yourself. Am I strong enough, right? Can I forage for food? Can I build houses? You were comparing yourself. Am I strong enough? Am I smart enough? Am I skilled enough? Comparing ourselves is a natural instinct. So try not to beat yourself up for comparing yourself, right? Knowing that that's natural, but it's when it gets in a way in our way of our values, right? And then we start living our life for other people or to abide by those comparisons, right? So I notice myself every day compare. And then I ask myself, wait, is that, am I going to let that change my behavior? And if I do, would that take me further away or closer to my values, Right. I talk to my clients all the time about the shoulds, right? Usually if it's an external should, that means we're starting to live our life for someone else. If it's an internal should, and we can reframe it like I need, I want, it's more likely internal, then I might lean into that. 
But if I rephrase that should, like I should do this, I should do that, right? Like perfect example we were just talking about before we started, right? Like I last minute volunteer to do my, to, to do the um, decorate a trunk, right? At my child's school because I didn't have enough. And those of you, many of you on here know me well, like creativity, not my thing. Like Hobby Lobby <laughs> gives me a lot of anxiety. Joanne Fabric Store, nope. La, I, I get panicky, I get sweaty, right? I don't want to decorate a trunk, but they needed trunks. I think of these poor little kids getting really sad and not having enough trunks. So here I am doing Michael's curbside pickup with the trunk kit, which you can now get fellow parents and caregivers. <laughs> and I'm going to use a whole roll of duct tape and I'm going to duct tape some sort of kit and black and white and orange construction things to my trunk tonight. And we're going to call it good, but you better believe there's a moment of Oh crap. You know, I'm going to pull up next to somebody who's got their whole car as like Godzilla. Right. And it's like, a, <laughs> it's like a Halloween mansion. They, you know, it, that's going to happen. And I'm totally okay with that. Right. Because being crafty is not in my value set. It's not, you know, it is eating candy. That is one of my <laughs> values. And so I will be there. I will be eating candy and I will have a crap ton of duct tape on my car. <laughs> and that's where we're at. So Am I going to compare myself probably to other cars? Yeah. And I'm going to laugh about it, right? Because that's just not me. So kind of putting ourselves in check a little bit when those things happen about what is us it's really hot in here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, just kind of laughing about it, right? When thing, when those things kind of come up. All right. Next one. Um, I love these. This is where I think Instagram can be really helpful and motivating when some of these things come up. Um, and I will give you guys some other people to kind of follow and resources at the end. But I love this on the right, that desire to lose weight as a natural and protective response to living in a fat phobic society. I could go on for weeks about fat phobia. That is a whole nother talk. We live in an extremely fat phobic society. Many of you remember, um, and I adore Michelle Obama adore her, but she was the leader right on this war on obesity. That was kind of her initial platform. She has since learned a lot and, and, and evolved from that. Like we all learn, right. But this war on obesity, think about that. You guys war, war on a person living in a larger body. Like that's what we're saying. There are so many individuals who naturally and at their truly healthiest are obese, right? Don't, do not even get me started on the BMI because again, that's a whole nother, mm -hmm. like I, everybody that knows me knows, like, if you want to see me get heated, someone put on the chat, like, I think the BMI is great. And like, I, I'm going to lose it, <laughs> but it is the most ridiculous measure we have. And yet there's a lot of companies and organizations that still show these categories. There's a lot of doctor's offices, right? That still show those categories and like, okay, you're in the obese category. So, right. I don't care what an astronomer said hundreds of years ago that I'm obese. Like I don't care about it. Right. It has nothing to do with who I am and how I want to live my life. So we have been conditioned that, oh my gosh, don't you dare be obese. What if you're in a larger body? It is so unfortunately true that people in larger bodies are discriminated against, right? We know that. We, there is so much research and evidence to show that. They are also discriminated against going into a medical provider's office, right? Medical providers tend to, and I love medical providers, many in my family, but they are also trained themselves to look at weight and body size as an indicator of health. And we know it is not, right? There's so many other realms of health. Whether you yourself have said this or someone around you have said this, I know I can totally got all of these on the left. I think about this at times when I felt like I wanted to lose weight, right? That what is it really about? And I think for yourself, if that's where you're at now or have been or are in the future, that's okay because we're going to get plummeted with that, right? New Year's resolution, get ready for the mil millions of dollars of marketing we're all going to see, right? About losing weight and everybody wanting to make money on their new apps and diets and cleanses and gyms, right? Yeah. So asking yourself, what do I really want by trying to lose weight? What am I actually needing to change in my life? And can I get that without sacrificing food that I enjoy, time with 
the people I love connecting over meals and things like that. Um, is it really that bad? Uh, I won't, uh, this is where it can get kind of, um, well, sad, right? Rates of depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts are there at an all time high. Um, suicide's the second leading cause of death. And, and this is, this is the National Institute of Mental Health of 2019. I know there's some preliminary studies for 20 and 21 out there, um, but they're not as large, of course, as the National, National Institute for Mental Health puts out. So that's why it, it could be a slightly skewed here um, since the pandemic. There's a lot of preliminary pandemic studies as well. Um, this one, the 2019 study, 75% oh, of teen girls with low self-esteem engaged in harmful behaviors, 75%. And I know my dear friend and colleague over here, Brooke is sighing because we also have girls and I have two girls. And so this is a professional and personal passion of mine. And I feel like my only other option is keeping them locked in a bubble, which would create a lot of other issues. I, I'm fully aware, um, but I know, I know that right now they're five and two. And so they're, they think that they are the most magnificent creatures ever because they kind of are. Mm -hmm. And I know that the world will tell them otherwise very soon. Mm -hmm. Like I know that. And that is definitely something that keeps me up and definitely something that keeps me doing this work every day mm -hmm. and talking to you guys, because if I can change one or two of your minds, um, it might be a different world for my girls growing up, right? They might not hate their bodies as much as I did growing up, right? As much as my mom did as much as all my friends did. Um, so many of my friends growing up had eating disorders and were miserable in their body. Um, and I, I want different for my girls. So give it the best shot I can. Um, diets may help people lose weight in the short term, right? Absolutely. All these diets you hear about definitely help in the short term. You could absolutely lose weight quickly. I'm not denying that. But 95% of 95% of people, and there's some studies that say 99% of people who diet regain the weight and oftentimes more around two years, there is not a single diet in the history of diets that has long-term success. Okay. So next time you're at happy hour and someone's like, have you heard the most successful diet is intermittent fasting? No, it's not. No, it's not short-term. Yes, absolutely. I, I would never argue that. Anytime we change our caloric intake or we start over exercising, our body weight may change. But when we push our weight, we push our bodies past that natural set point where it's healthiest, we have to make great sacrifices for that. And eventually our bodies kind of want to swing back to that natural set point. Um, but I also, let me just say, I also get it. Like the diet industry is super sexy. It's sexy. Like it is the images they put, the slogans they put, not to mention the wellness world, which I am not, I love the wellness world. The problem is, is that the diet industry has hijacked that word. I love the word wellness. I was presenting on wellness a few years ago, but then diet industry diet apps have now taken that word and used it and to put it on as a mask for another diet. And that just really <laughs> frustrates me because wellness was a really beautiful, all encompassing word for a very long time. So they basically, they keep taking our words. <laughs> what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, so I say that just to be really cautionary when someone's like, Ooh, wellness plan, sign up for that. It could be a really beautiful way to reconnect with your body and reconnect with foot. It absolutely could be, but just be really skeptical. If they're, if that wellness plan or that person is, is telling you to restrict or to eat things that you know, your body likes and enjoys, then question it. Um, and we, and we kind of know a lot of this right around the distorted body image, negative self-esteem, hatred have been proven to increase psychiatric symptoms. Um, the diet industry, this is one that I tried to pull the most recent stats on. And so that's why I pulled the, the 2021 stats seven. This is just diet. You guys, this is not makeup. This is not beauty. This is not clothes. This is not skincare. $78 billion industry. I don't even know what that number means but I know that that's a lot and that's just around diets. And the thing is diet industries, they also know they don't work long-term and that's why they're so profitable because they want you to come back on them, right? A few months later, a few year, a year later, they want you, they know you're gonna feel like a failure, like you fell off the wagon and hey, you need us to be at the weight you think you need to be at. So come back on us, buy the food again, 
by the materials, by the coaching, right? Um, so that we can, you can ultimately spend money with us again. So, and I welcome all the hate mail from all the diet companies after my presentation. <laughs> I will send you my home address and you are welcome to send me whatever you like. <laughs> I will leave you my email and Instagram and feel free to send me all of that. Um, but just a little more, a few stats here, right? So really important, um, sick enough is that first quote there from Dr. Gaudiani's book, sick enough. Um, and she's kind of one of the physicians, I would say one of the experts in our field as well. Um, and this just talks about, right, like how we overlook and overemphasize that weight equals health. And we know that there is health at every size, that we need to look at how people feel in their bodies um, and also question sometimes how we feel with aches and pains and things like that. Sometimes it is medical. Sometimes it is emotional pain and trauma and a lot of guilt that they are feeling in their bodies. Their bodies are trying to talk to us and say like, please feed me more regularly. Please rest me. Please take care of me. And that's something that my clients and I talk a lot about is what is your body asking for? What is it trying to tell you? Um, the bottom one, I just think it's really important to also recognize how big of a problem this can be regarding um, obviously diet pills and laxatives that you can go buy at CVS and Walgreens. Um, you don't have to have a prescription for these. And so many teenagers, especially that are driving and they have their own money can go buy all these things and it can be so dangerous. Um, I had a client recently who I, I started recently and she had a lot of GI symptoms, which is um, one of a lot of medical complications, right? Come from eating disorders, but a lot of GI symptoms as well. And she had been abusing laxatives on and off for about two years. Her family didn't know she got very good at hiding it, but she was going to her primary care doctor with a lot of physical complaints that were real. And she was so ashamed that the diet pills that she was using, she had read the bottle. She knew what the risks were, but was going to do it anyways. Right. Because the idea of losing weight was so appealing to her that she was willing to do whatever it took. And the doctor, right, understandably was going down all these rabbit holes trying to, she got scoped, right? She went and got all these tests done and she wasn't telling anybody what she was taking, right? We could have spent two years um, knowing exactly what was going on with her physically. So teenagers especially um, are more, more, excuse me, at risk of of being prey to some of these pills. I also, I was working with a local high school literally down the street from us here and working with some of the counselors there because they were seeing a lot of diet pills being sold within the high school. And it wasn't something that was ashamed or hidden. It was kind of laughed about, talked about. It was, since it was over the counter, there wasn't a lot of shame to it. And so it was just kind of passed around and everyone was taking it right before spring break. Um, and they were seeing seizures and they were seeing, you know, kids passing out at school. So I wish I could say it's, it's rare, but it's not. All right. So that's kind of my deep dive into something that's sad. Let's do a little bit better. Um, things are looking up. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's pull out of that dark place right so a couple of these things um the body quality i'm wearing i'm representing my old navy store um and my old navy dress today because old navy is one of the first major clothing brand chains to offer people of all sizes i think they're up to 26 or 28 in store at the same price there's a lot of stores that still charge more, talk about discrimination, right? Um, for their quote plus size. I can't, I can't with that, I can't. So just think about too where you're putting your money for you, for your kids and, and being just mindful about um, really supporting businesses, local businesses, or even major chains, right? Who are supporting people of all different body sizes. Um, and I also, the middle quote I really like, but it's also really important to me as I've worked with a lot of individuals during COVID and quarantine that they would obsess about their body and their body size. And we were able to eventually kind of laugh about it a little bit like, wow, I was, I was the only one seeing my body or even when I did go out, I was in sweat and that's still all I could think about. Right. And so just kind of thinking about that, like we get one chance at this body, we need to start taking better care of it right? And not from a restriction diet place or trying to change the weight. 
Um, that last one, obviously we talk about, I'll continue to talk about being conditioned to hate our bodies. Um, and that starts in elementary school. Those messages are already starting with my kids, um, which is also in a whole nother discussion. Um, if any teachers or educators out there, the Dove Confident Me, I'm a big fan of this, you guys. I've been through all, like I've looked through all of it to make sure I'm not putting out there something I, I wouldn't recommend. But, or if you have an in at your kid's school, there's a, it's free. It's a free teacher toolkit. There's handout resources. So anybody in the school or education system, it's very cool. It's free. Um, just a great way to teach kids about being confident in their body and being open to body diversity and this kind of body gratitude piece. So love that resource. Surrounding yourself with images and messages that make you feel confident and empowered. Um, if you are scrolling any sort of social media or anything and you are comparing yourself and immediately you feel this tinge of I'm not good enough or something should change, unfollow that person. If it is your sister or your brother or somebody very close to you, then just hide them. I, I'm not trying to start family <laughs> drama before the holidays, but like just you can also hide their view, right? But that is important because even if you think just like I do that I have a very thick skin to it. Even if you're scrolling, especially late at night, your brain is absorbing those messages. It still is absorbing them, even if we don't realize it. So just be very protective of yourself and everything that your eyes and ears are seeing. Okay. Um, if you're a parent, educator, coach, grandparent, be thoughtful about not commenting um, on anyone's body. And instead, and this is a really big one, and this is something that I still catch myself, especially with people that I've known my whole life, right? Um, now, I am not saying that it's bad or you're doing anything wrong by commenting on that, but it's just more helpful that we can shift kind of this cultural piece around we value each other for who we are, for our bravery, for our courage, on these women figuring out the technology of a virtual conference <laughs> when that's not their forte, right? They're therapists and they're figuring out the technology. Like, that's freaking amazing. And it's a lot more amazing than their body size, right? Their body size is the last thing that I care about, right? These women I've worked with, they are helping me do this. I do not care what their bodies look like. And that sounds so obvious, but yet when we see people or we can reconnect with people, we tend to comment on that or compliment. Remember that weight loss is not always a good thing. There are a lot of people out there that are losing weight that don't want to be, that are sick, that are losing weight because they are depressed and anxious. And when we comment on it without understanding, we are perpetuating that not only do we value their weight or their body size, but also that we see them now because they're losing weight. And that is not what we want, right? It is not what we want. We want them to know that no matter what their body looks like, I see you, I see you for who you are. I love you for who you are. And that's so important, even with my clients too. I mean, I don't say I love them because that's, you know, a boundary issue, but like I do talk to them about, it's so true. Their body size is the least interesting thing about them. Right. And it's really important that we start to work through that a little bit. Um, another topic I could talk about for forever um, is that kids are watching us all the time not just our own kids, but other kids as well. And this is something that my friends and my neighbors, we all talk about all of us as parents. And it is so important. I see my girls watch everything that I do includes when I cuss that also, they're also <laughs> watching that and they do repeat those things. But you know what? I would so much rather them go to school and cuss and repeat yep. what I say, than be ashamed of their bodies right? Or to think that their body is not good enough. Oh, like that makes me, that makes me like, what a panic mm -hmm. when I just think about it. But if they go to school and they, you know, use the F word, I'll be like, okay, that's, that's my bad, you know, like, <laughs> sorry. But when they go to, when they go to school and they are making friends and including everyone else or complimenting someone else, one of their little friends for including them and being gracious and kind, like, oh, the best, right? So this might be a little TMI, but some different ways to do this. Again, I could talk about this all day. We could always do a future thing on this if you guys want to. Um, but it's really important that they're watching that they're watching what we eat. They're watching how we talk about food. They're watching if we provide, you know, if we mention any negative comments about carbs or fat or sweets with Halloween coming up, um, I want to caution everyone to not use the word or avoid saying anything about junk food 
or talking about candy that it's crap because then kids are more likely to eat it in secret, to binge on it, or to eat it and feel ashamed afterwards. Um, Halloween candy is something that we have in our house at all times. We have candy and ice cream and chocolate and that in our house at all times. So Halloween is not something that like the first time they get candy, right? Um, but it is exciting. Of course, they're gonna go trick or treating, but it is not something if we hold any sort of food on a pedestal, then we naturally as humans want it more and are more likely to binge on it. This is human nature. So really talking about food um, in a balanced way, in a nutrient strong way, what nutrients, right? Um, give us energy, what nutrients give us strength, what nutrients help our eyes and our ears and all of those things. Um, my oldest daughter, if she could eat pickles 24 seven, she would. Um, and pickles are not healthy or unhealthy, right? All food is healthy, but she needs some other nutrients other than pickles, right? Cause that has probably a lot of sodium. So really talking about that when my girls see me getting dressed or they are with me as I'm getting ready, um, and they make comments about mom, do you have a baby in your belly? Which I do not, by the way. And I say, no, I don't. But isn't that so amazing that, that women's bodies can, that's so cool. Or when they grab my butt and they talk about it being jiggly, like, yeah. And isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing, right? That women's butts, that people's butts can do that, right? So everything they talk about, it's, we talk about how incredible the body is. And when they do things, we talk about their strength and their courage and all of those things. Um, that I talk about how beautiful they are, but it doesn't come from how they look, right? It comes from who they are and how they're treating other people. I don't talk about it as much when they're fighting and like ripping each other's hair out, but we pause then and we come back to that later. So um, any questions on that, of course, let me know. And there's a lot of really good books and podcasts out there. There's a whole podcast I'll go to that talks about this and ways to do this um, to build up our, our kids' self-esteem in this realm. Okay, so I want to make sure, all right, I'm good on time. So here's a couple, a few things we're going to go over to really help to do our own work, okay? So this is to do ourself. This is to do with our kids. I do a lot of this with my kids with me. Um, and some of this you can even obviously do in the presence of others, basically. Mirror work. Um, when you are looking in the mirror, um, whether by yourself or with kids, your brain is inherently conditioned to usually go to something that it's going to critique. And instead of immediately um, kind of leaning into that or overindulging on what that critique is, like a lot of us, I'm sure on this, have, have done a lot of ACT and CBT work and all of that, but think about it in the mirror is like, let that thought go and then be intentional and mindful about, okay, I'm going to go to one part of my body that I'm either really proud of I think is really strong and capable. If we can't, if that is too painful or we're too far away from that, then at least go to a place that we can see in our body that at least we feel neutral about, right? Um, and think about something that has like during the day or will help you, that part of your body that will help you live your day out, right? So this is where I love doing some of that act work of what, how has that part of your body and I do a lot of mere exposure work in my sessions as well. How has that part of your body helped you live into your values today, right? Did you hug your friend, right? Because I know being a really supportive, loving friend is really important to you. And you hugged her with those arms, those arms that your inner critic are telling you aren't good enough, but you hugged your friend, right? You carried your stuff, you know, some of those things. So being really specific in that, did you hug your kids with those arms that then your brain is telling you like they're too flabby, they're too pale, right? It's like, yeah, but I hugged my kids. I hugged my partner. Um, I opened the door for someone and made their day, whatever it is, right? Daily affirmations, body script or mantras. Some people love mantras. Other people are like, oh, right? I get it. Whatever your thing is, body script for those that are, um, religious or spiritual, this can be really, really powerful. Um, so scripture, you know, a lot of people can say the Lord's prayer, like the back of their hand or things like that. For some of my clients that are spiritual or more religious, they, we together work on a body scripture for themselves, something that they repeat to themselves. Sometimes when they're anxious about something, or they're having one of those really hard days, those body image days that they repeat to themselves over and over again, until they at least start to believe parts of it. Um, and it can be really powerful. And sometimes people will put it on their mirror or have it in their phone or things like that. 
Um, same thing with daily affirmations. I think it's so important the way we talk to ourselves. It's so important. Oh my gosh. If we said to our friends or our coworkers, what we said to ourselves, like I, I would not have any friends. I would not have a job. My clients would not come see me. Um, so putting that in check a little bit, right. And like, I would never say that to me. I was like, why is it okay to say it to myself when it's my body? It's everything taking me through this life. Um, body grief work is another one that, again, I could talk about for hours, but, um, it's okay. And I think it's important to allow yourself to grieve. Um, if you do have a disability, if your body, if you got a diagnosis that is changing things for your body, um, if your body has created experiences where you were traumatized, right. Um, or discriminated against that it is okay. And part of something that I think it's important to grieve, um, that that's a loss, right. Or that, um, also a lot of my clients in larger bodies, we work on grieving that their body is healthiest in a larger body. And so grieving that their body set point, um, is not ever going to be in it's never going to fit into the, I, the kind of societal view of what's like sexy in this right size. Right. Um, and there's some grief around that and that's okay. Instead of just pretending, right. Or just being like, I love my body. Even when we don't, we're miserable. Um, I think it's important to grieve that and to really own that, um, can be powerful and also hard closet makeover. Um, I'm a big fan of Marie condoing your closet, not from like, I can't fold the way she does. So like, not necessarily, I mean, I, it's awesome if you can do that, but if there are clothes that you, that you do not fit into, or that the, uh, trying to get into jeans or pants or whatever, get rid of them, get them out of your house, donate them, swap them with another friend. I have a friend in my a close friend in my neighborhood and she laughs. She's like, I'm so glad I moved in this neighborhood because we are the same height but she is in a different body than me. So she gets so many of my clothes as my body has changed throughout the last several years, having kids and all that. I'm always like, you know, doesn't fit. Here you go. She's like, oh my God, this is great. So it's really important that we don't have clothes that are in our home, especially in our closet, because I know the closet can be a really fragile place for a lot of people. So getting rid of those things. So they're not there taunting us or making us feel less than as we're getting ready. It's really important that we feel comfortable and confident in what we wear. And if that item of clothing does not bring us joy, then we need to get rid of it because it might bring somebody else joy. Um, trashing the scale is very important. And uh, there's no reason to have a scale in your home, um, food scale or body weight scale. Um, I understand that there are some, very few, but some medical conditions where people do need scales. Um, but for the most part, for the majority of individuals that that is only going to bring about shame. Um, and it's also, I think also can kind of also bring about a distorted message to children or teens in the house by saying like your weight doesn't matter, but then here's a scale where we take our weight, right? It's very confusing. Um, and it also disconnects us from listening to our body and what our body needs. Um, I already mentioned that working towards body neutrality and acceptance, um, picture practice is one that we live in a very picture focused society. So when you're looking at your own pictures or anything that you are in, your brain might again, like the mirror go immediately towards the criticism or, Oh, I hate that picture delete. Even if you really want to delete it, wait at least a few seconds or a few minutes and try to take the time to remember what that picture captures, right? what that picture captures. What is the memory of that picture? That is the, I know we forgot this, right? But 10, 20 years ago, pictures were about capturing a moment, not about changing ourselves and altering ourselves. I so miss the days when I would go to CBS and pick up my pictures from my disposable camera and you don't remember what's on them and you're so excited. We couldn't change those, right? We weren't as critical as we were about our bodies, um, but now we are because we can change it all. And we can delete it instantly. Um, and that makes it really, really hard. Um, we talked about number nine and, and number 10 being joyful movement. This is a really important one to think about everybody who is doing or has, I have um, different 
movement or exercise plans that are 30 days this, right? Or I have to run four miles a day or setting these goals. Um, just really, really think about, is it bringing you joy, right? If running does not bring you joy, mm -hmm. then don't run. Find another way to move your body that brings you joy. And we are all beautifully unique in this, right? Beautifully unique in this. I used to run. I run two half marathons. I hate running. Like I hate it. Um, you won't see me running, but I was definitely running for the wrong reasons. So if, whether it's playing with your kids, whether it's riding a bike, whether it's walking, whether it's stretching, right? Um, move your body in a way that brings you joy. And that is another way to really take care of our body instead of punishing it through exercise. Like, well, if I'm going to eat this, I have to go work out. Well, now we're just spending an hour or however long it is punishing our body, right? Instead of doing something that feels good to us. And instead of making these pre, you know, kind of plans, like I'm going to do this for 30 days. What if your body doesn't want to do that for 30 days, right? What if you have a cold the next day or the next week and your body's like, I need to rest. It's like, no, I signed up for this. Like that's body disconnection, right? So really just listening to your body and listening to what it's asking for. All right, so let's go into a few resources. Um, some, again, this is a slide of several books that I really love, kind of a good place to start around a lot of this work. The Your Body is Not an Apology. She, um, does, she has a great book. I just put the workbook on here for people that wanna really start to like dig in and do their own work. But I would highly recommend reading her body, her book first before you do the workbook or at least kind of skim through it. She has one of the most beautiful quotes and important messages. And it, I think about it literally every day. And that is that sh believing or thinking that we need to shrink our body to be more valuable in this society is a form of oppression. And when I think about that, I want to resist it in every way possible. I never want to think about being oppressed, right? That makes me just want to like scream. So to, for any system, right? Any group, any person to make me feel that I need to shrink, that I need to be smaller to be more valuable. Cool. That like really lights a fire <laughs> under me. So thinking about, and she talks a lot about that in her work. Um, a lot of these books, again, have a lot of really good information um, and daily practices. So um, let's see. Oh yeah. Podcasts. So I am a big fan of podcasts. They are free. You can listen to them on anyone. Um, the full bloom podcast is one that I was talking about with parenting. And so it's all about, they have different experts on there. They have school. They also have teachers on there and school nutritionists and things like that. Talking about what they're doing. Canada is doing some really cool things in their nutrition programs and schools. Oh my gosh. It's so cool. So hopefully we can bring some of that to the U S but a lot of these podcast, you can also look at all the titles, right. And see, like, if you are, if you have diabetes, how can I love my body and have diabetes, right? Um, how do I love carbs and sugar when I have diabetes, those kinds of things. So a lot of really good podcasts here as well. Um, top right, the seasoned RD, a little shout out to Beth Harrell, a dietitian who I worked with for many years at Children's Mercy. Um, she and another dietitian are doing this incredible podcast um, for anybody working with individuals with disordered eating of any kind. Um, and it's really good, really, really good. Um, also a novel truth or a novel life, excuse me, down there on the bottom, right? She does a lot of RODBT and she kind of brings about all the skills and in a really kind of informal way, which is really good. So I've learned a lot from her and bring a lot of those RODBT skills that I've learned and I've learned in conferences, but the way she kind of presents it is really helpful as well. Um, yeah, I saw a message. Do I also encourage the intuitive eating book? Oh my gosh. Yes. hundred percent. Um, intuitive eating is kind of the, obviously kind of the Holy grail of nutrition. As far as I'm concerned, I think it's something that anybody, regardless of their, um, medical diagnosis, their size can do, but obviously it, it takes more practice and some people won't need more support than others with intuitive eating. So yeah, the intuitive eating book and workbook. And then there's also an intuitive eating workbook for teens. That's awesome. I use a lot in the session, um, highly recommend those as well. Um, Obviously references, that's always pretty boring. Um, and my last one, um, obviously with that slide there regarding um, 
I think this is really important, especially for all of us. I know it's she, it's those are female adjectives there, but are pronouns. But I will say too that I think that men also struggle with a lot of this as well and these expectations that it's really important, especially during COVID, there's been so much weight bias and fear mongering about weight gain and weight gain during COVID. Again, I did the presentation last year on that. And it's so important to remind ourselves that your body does some really cool things to protect us. And sometimes that is get by gaining weight. Um, sometimes that's by losing weight, but our body is incredibly protective and will sometimes override what some of our fears are and will gain or lose weight, especially for women in the postnatal phase of their body healing. Oh, it's incredible what a woman's body does after she has a child, um, not just from having a child, but in a lot of ways. But it's really important to know that this whole, when people talk about getting their body back, it's like, why would I want to get my body back to before I had kids? I don't want to pretend like I didn't have them. Like, why would my body be the same? Um, I was laughing with one of my clients the other day. Um, she's in her late thirties and she was like, we, I've worked with her on and off for about two years and we were kind of laughing. She's like, I mean, why do I want my 20 year old body back? She's like, I was a hot mess when I was 20. Like, <laughs> so if I got that body back with everything along with it, like I would be a disaster. Like, I don't want that body back. And we talk about how much our bodies have learned and evolved with that time that it's okay to embrace all the changes also really hard in our culture. Um, so I was just reading some of the questions of the resources, any prefer for masculine presenting people? Absolutely. Um, the intuitive eating book, uh, the body is not apology, although it is a, um, female cl client, female writer. Um, she does a beautiful job at bringing in a lot of, uh, a lot of male resources and some of the male lived story as well. I also will be honest with you because for my male clients, I, and I say male as in gender assigned at birth or identify as male. Doesn't matter to me. If someone presents to me as male, they are male and there are not enough resources. I'll be totally honest with you. It is one of my biggest frustrations. Um, I do know a couple of people in our field. Uh, I do know a couple of males in our field that are currently writing books. Um, there is a book out of Canada that I think is really good, but it's insanely expensive to try and get. So there's just not a lot of, um, there's not enough. Let me say that. With that said, on those podcasts I mentioned, they do, especially body kindness, um, that podcast, I can go back to it. Um, the body kindness, um, which will share the book, obviously, uh, yeah, here she is. So that podcast by Rebecca Stretchfield, she's a dietitian. She also has a lot of male um, experts on there talking about their lived experience. And that's been really helpful. So I've guided a lot of my male clients to her podcast, but very specific ones where she has males on there as well. Um, same thing, the food psych podcast, she has a lot of males on there too. Um, especially for my teenage male clients, I try to always um, steer them towards those uh, male voices. I think that's very important. All right. Oh, yes. Thank you for the code word. It is fuel and grace. Okay. So the code words are fuel and grace. So think about body fuel and having grace for your body, right? Grace for what your body is doing, for what it's asking you for, and what it needs. So I will pause there and answer any questions you guys have. Um, I know I threw a lot at you. So let me know what questions you have. I'm watching the chat. <laughs> I did leave my email and website up there. If anybody does have any questions, I really am happy to answer it. I do like, I enjoy pointing people towards resources. Um, the eating disorder treatment community in Kansas City is an awesome one. And um, I would say a rather, relatively smaller one. I think we're growing. And so I'm happy to point people towards resources if they feel a little bit out of, um, out of their scope, or even if you want to do your own work and you feel like even some of the things I talked about feel pretty, um, overwhelming to do on your own. I'd happy to provide you with some different resources too, or people to talk to in the community who are really incredible doing this. So thank you guys. You guys are so kind in these messages. Any questions, email me. Um, and have a happy Halloween, everyone. Just 
we'll just get through it together. <laughs> and if you see me at my kid's school with a bunch, if you see a car full of duct tape, that's mine. Okay, that's mine. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Okay, thank you so much, Whitney. And um, we will start back up again at 1230. So around 1225 or so, we'll start coming back to our Zoom. Um, thank you all. Have a great lunch.